Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 6K, where we're going to transition from thinking about SNP typing of genomes to actually sequencing either the whole genome or what's called the exome. We'll talk about what an exome is and why we would sequence it rather than a genome. We'll talk about how you can get your exome or possibly your genome sequence how I got my exome sequenced, and what I learned from it, including a couple of things that were surprisingly relevant to topics that we've talked about in earlier modules. So first, what's an exome anyway? Well, an exome is a term that was invented to refer to the expressed part of the genome. So in this diagram of the functions of the genome, the exome is basically the protein coding genes the exons of the protein coding genes, not the introns. So practically, it's all the coding sequences and the sequences closely adjacent to them. So it captures much of the regulatory sequences as well. Now, how this is done is fairly simple. Whole genome sequencing is done by obtaining a DNA sample um, in direct-to-consumer sequencing, this would be a spit kit like that used for um, SNP typing. The DNA is purified and broken into short fragments, often it's amplified, and then the fragments are sequenced many times over. If the goal is to just sequence the exome, just the coding sequences, you need to separate those from all the rest of the DNA, the 98% of the DNA genome that you don't want to sequence. And that's done by breaking the DNA into fragments that are about a KB long. So we have a tube here, test tube, with the DNA fragments of the genome, include, which is going to be a mixture of fragments of coding sequences, what you're interested in, and an enormous amount of non-coding sequences that you don't want to waste time and money sequencing and analyzing. To get rid of the unwanted DNA, the DNA is passed through a special filter that traps the coding sequences. And it does this by being single-stranded DNA with sequences complementary to coding sequences. The whole DNA is first denatured, so it can form base pairs with this DNA. And then the sample is washed so that all of the non-coding DNA, which doesn't stick to the filter, gets thrown away. The desirable exon DNA can then be released from the filter, transferred to a fresh tube, and used for sequencing. Now, what do we learn from sequencing an exome or a whole genome? Well, we have to first compare that exome or genome sequence to the sequence of a known genome, usually a standard human reference genome. And from the comparison, we can learn quite a lot. Not only do we learn about the presence of known SNP polymorphisms, some of this you would also learn from a SNP chip, but here you learn about all the known polymorphisms in the genome, find out which alleles you have, but you will also find rare differences, differences that are present at less than 1%, so they're not SNPs. You'll learn about those. In particular, you'll learn about unique differences, differences that are present in your genome, but not known to exist in anyone else's genome. And finally, you'll also learn about insertions and deletions, where it's the same sequence but different numbers of copies or where certain sequences are missing. So here for instance the reference genome has two copies of a short repeat but the exome genome that's been sequenced has three copies. Now why would you want to sequence first an exome rather than a genome? Well the exome's a lot cheaper you get almost as much potentially useful information for about 2% of the sequencing cost. But why would you want to sequence a genome at all? Well, sequencing a genome can let you find, for instance, the cause of an unexplained disease. And I particularly recommend that you read about a project 
called the B Project, um, where Dr. Hugh Reinhoff used um, genome sequencing to find the mutation that was causing an unexplained phenotype in his daughter Beatrice. Or you might have your genome or your exome sequenced just because you're curious, and that's what I did. So how can you get this done? Well, there are lots of companies that will sequence exomes, but these are not direct-to-consumer companies. They will sequence exomes for research, they will sequence them for physicians, seek genomes of patients, but they won't do it for just the consumer. I had my exome sequenced in a project from 23andMe. It was, unfortunately for you, nice for me, it was a pilot project and it's no longer available. Um, it is possible to get your whole genome sequenced. Um, the sequencing company Illumina that produces most of the technology that's used today um, runs a program called Understand Your Genome and for a mere $5,000 you will get an iPad with your genome sequence on it and a full day um, symposium to help you understand your genome. This is targeted mainly at healthcare professionals and researchers but it is also open to the general public. There's also another company, DNA DTC, where DTC actually stands for direct to consumer. And this company will sequence your genome for you. Um, oh no, I'm sorry. They will sequence your exome for you. And the cost is about $900. That's about what I paid to 23andMe. Now, what is it I learned from having my exome sequenced by 23andMe? Well, luckily, I didn't have to analyze the raw data myself, although I could have if I'd wanted to because they provided the raw data. Instead, they sent me a detailed summary of their analysis of my data. And the first couple of pieces of information are descriptions of the steps they had to take to eliminate all of the uninteresting sequences and poor quality sequences from their data. Once that was done, they were able to compare my exome sequence to the reference human genome and to tell me what kinds of variation they found. Almost all of the variation they found was what they categorized as unknown. These were differences that didn't look like they were going to have any phenotypic effect, but they couldn't be sure. There were other differences indicated in yellow, differences that were silent changes in coding genes um, or changes in non-coding or functional DNA. They found a moderate fraction of places where an amino acid would be changed by a genetic difference or there was an insertion of, or deletion of some sequences. And then a very, very small fraction of the sequences, 0.4%, was of the differences were differences that were expected to make a large difference to the function of a gene. They pulled this apart a bit more for the sequences that were going to make big differences. Some of them were frame shifts, changes in splicing out of introns, um, start codon or, or stop codon changes. They also told me how rare the differences that they found were. And what you see is that Almost all the differences that they found between my genome and the reference genome were differences that were known to be present in lots of people. More than 5% of the population had these differences. And then another small, much smaller fraction was differences that were still qualified as polymorphisms, present in more than 1%. And then a much smaller fraction, differences that were known but present in less than 1%. So these would be relatively rare. Other differences, the red differences, were known to be present in other individuals, but the frequency wasn't known. They only had small samples, for instance. And 641 of the differences were differences that had never been seen in anybody else before. Now, most of these differences were not interesting. They gave me a summary of the ones that they thought might be interesting, and there were two 
that I thought were interesting that might be interesting to this class too. And the first was discovering that I have a mutation in CFTR, the gene where mutations cause the serious genetic disease cystic fibrosis that we talked about in module three. Now, I don't have the mutation that causes a serious defect, and that mutation is recessive. I also have a normal copy of this gene. Instead, I have a mutation that's less common and causes much less severe defect in the protein. It turned out that this particular de defective allele had been reported before. It's in the cystic fibrosis mutation database, and there's even a research paper about this particular mutation. Basically, what it says that if you have this mutation and a normal allele, you're fine. And even if you have this mutation and the severe um, deletion mutation in CFTR, you're still not nearly as sick as someone who's homozygous for the deletion mutation. This is useful information. Nobody in my family has a history of cystic fibrosis. But if someone in my family were to marry into a family that had a history of cystic fibrosis, it would certainly be important to be tested for this allele. The other mutation that I thought might interest this class was, it turns out that I have a mutation in the phenylalanine hydroxylase gene. This is the gene that causes um, phenylketonuria, the disease, the serious genetic metabolic disease that all the babies are checked for by pricking their heel and testing their blood. Um, again, I'm heterozygous with a normal allele. This causes the mutation that I have, changes a single amino acid. It's never been reported to cause any problems. So what have we done? We've talked about whole genome and exome sequencing, what they are, what an exome is, what we can learn from sequencing, how it's done at a very simple level, and then a little bit about what I learned by having my exome sequenced. Coming up next, um, getting into something that will probably be, I think, of more general interest, we're going to talk briefly about the kinds of ethical issues that arise out of personal genomics. I hope to see you there.